those that are listening uh, to uh, as well as Zoom. I'm amazed they told me last time I uh, preached there was uh, 50 people coming in by means of electronics, which they'll realize it too uh, when they hear it, but there are those that are unable to come that, or people from other churches that are just not comfortable yet uh, coming out in COVID time that uh, join the St. John's Church. So we want to welcome you. Let's bow our heads as we open our lesson today. Thank you, Lord, that we can accept the promise that your spirit will lead and guide us to understandings of the Bible. And we appreciate that. And we invite his presence and guidance in our discussion this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You'll notice that it's thought that uh, there is value in having a mic set up uh, uh, in the corridor so that those that uh, desire to make a comment, they can use the mic. If you choose not to use the mic, I will repeat the question so that uh, those that are online will be able to hear. All right, into our lesson, the church and education this week is our topic. And when I saw the topic title, um, it suggests to me that there are two sources of knowledge. The biblical revelation source and the investigation of our environment or natural discovery around us. The Bible declares that God can be seen and discovered in both, both out of discovery in nature as well as revelation. Uh, Romans chapter 120 says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. So the Bible clearly states that there are two sources, main sources of revelation or knowledge about God, one through the Bible and one through nature. Hebrews 1 says, God who in past times and in various ways spoke, spoke to us by the prophets. He has in his last day spoken to us by whom? By Jesus Christ. Um, so Jesus is a revelation and nature around us is a revelation. What we discover is a revelation, discover in around us, all can contribute to our knowledge of God. Th through the life of Christ recorded in the scriptures and recreation, God's attributes can be clearly discovered. The primary source of scripture, we are told in 2 Timothy 3.15, that from a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to do what? Can anybody finish that text? From a child you have known the scriptures, holy scriptures, were able to make you wise, and how to change a tire, create an engine, wise for what? Salvation. Yes, the scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation. The purpose of scripture and revelation of God is to make us wise unto salvation. It is not there to make you wise and how to make a dinner, uh, how to <coughs> change an engine in a car, uh, how to bake a cake. It's to make you wise unto salvation. So you have the two sources of knowledge the church is exposed to these two sources, and both are important. Um, the Bible does not have as its purpose to instruct you in every vocation of life. It provides principles to guide you, however, leads you to investigate and discover for yourself. Now here's where the important crunch comes. Throughout the ages, this tension between the two sources, Bible and investigation, has led to controversy, as there has been re primarily religious leaders who have taught that the Bible is superior to the revelation of nature and have imposed dominance on people's desire to investigate. And all you have to do is study history and know the challenge that has come through history where religious leaders feel that the spiritual is superior to the natural. And the Bible never presents the world in that controversy. 
because it is revelation and natural discovery both give glory to God. It's not revelation dominates natural discovery. So there's been there's been a challenge, and part of the challenge comes because religious leaders have felt threatened by the knowledge that it's a dilemma. The church, as a text of the ages, when there was fear of heretics or fear of false teaching, uh, the church usually has risen up and dominated. And of course, that has created difficulty. Until today, we have the reverse. We have natural discovery rising up and dominating, in many ways, uh, the scripture. There's an interesting uh, text in Ecclesiastes 1, and I'll try to unpack this text for me. For much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Increases sorrow. He who increases knowledge increases sorrow. How is it possible that in gaining more knowledge, you actually increase sorrow in your life? Anyone have a thought of how that's possible? There is a saying, what you don't know won't hurt you. Is that true? <laughs> is that true? You know, there are some people who won't go to the doctor because they said, if I go to the doctor, I'll find out what's wrong with me. If I don't know what's wrong with me, then I'm okay. There is a saying, like you said, that, um, yeah, you said it, and that is, what I don't know won't hurt me, and of course it can hurt you, it can end up killing you. Pain is a beautiful uh, gift to, uh, from God, although we don't like it, because pain is an indicator, do you better go and get something checked out? Yeah, that's that's... So anyone else have a comment on, with much knowledge comes, comes much sorrow? You feel that's true? The more you know, the more sorrow on your shoulders. When you think of a child who knows very little, and in innocency and playing, do they? he got involved with the teachings and environments there, and unfortunately he left the Lord. So there is danger, and it's good to be it's good for us to realize that wherever we are, there is a bias, and the bias is, is where the people are. And we, coming with a religious Christian bias, need to realize that we are going into a different environment to influence, and we can be influenced, and we need to realize that. All right, Wednesday's lesson is Seeking Truth. Is it true that your understanding of the Bible impacts how you see the world and how you worship? It is true. It is true. Your knowledge influences how you worship. You'll recall uh, when I had the message a couple weeks ago talking about uh, South America, was it Bolivia? where they actually worship the devil before they go into the mines because they have the conviction that the devil will spare life if he chooses to. So if they, if they believe that they worship him, then uh, he may favor them and protect them. Uh, does that influence, do you think, those people, how they worship when they go to church on Sunday? Because many of these people are Sunday worshipers there. Would that influence? If you believe that the devil could protect you and so you worship him, do you believe that that would influence you how you would come to church on Sabbath morning? Oh yeah, yeah. So how our knowledge influences us, our experience influences us from week to week. Now this is a tough question, I'm not sure if I captured it. Um, but listen to this, true or false? Not only does knowledge influence us how we worship, but does knowledge influence how we worship more than, so knowledge influences worship, does knowledge influence us more than the church influences us in gaining knowledge? So which one influences the most? Does our knowledge, the knowledge we gain, 
its influence on worship, does that, is that stronger than the church influence on us gaining knowledge? Which one would you say is the strongest? I'd say today is knowledge. So today in the environment, you would say knowledge. knowledge is stronger to influence us. Anyone else feel different? Anyone that feels that the church influences stronger in our gaining knowledge than knowledge influences us in the way we live. Which influences the most? I think today is knowledge. Our environment today is knowledge you think influences the strongest? Anyone think that church influences the strongest? Thomas? So Thomas says that because daily we live with in the area of knowledge out there in church, we tend to come once a week, that you would lean that knowledge out there would probably influence us more than the once a week church. Did I capture what you said? much are we impacted by our environment on a daily basis? Significantly, right? The world, yeah, whether it's the, whether it's the TV or the computers, we are daily impacted by our environment. Uh, and we have the Sabbath program, and unless we intentionally, intentionally include the spiritual uh, in devotion and family worship, uh, unless we reflect, the environment tends to have more time to impact us than, but because, because it tends maybe to have more time and more often, does that mean it has more influence? Does quantity equals greater influence? Oh, so if you're spiritual, you interpret what you see through spiritual. Okay, Larry's bringing out uh, another dimension of which influences us the most, and that is you have the tension between environment, which may or may not be a Christian environment, compared to a Christian influence. But within the Christian influence, there are various voices. And he's bringing out that some translations uh, are giving a wrong impression on a verse, and they have the potential. And that's why it's so important that we share. Because when you share, you're challenged. And when you challenge, you have to do investigation. And investigation of knowledge then helps bring out what is uh, true.
usually when you study many versions and have one that you know that, uh, that is, is built on a solid rock, and then you compare, and then you can go and, and have different commentaries on it and different perspectives on it, the truth tends to come out if you wanted to do the research that's necessary. Um, yeah, well, uh, that, that is also a struggle, and just to be uh, uh, transparent, that's also a struggle within the church. Um, and in recent times, one that says that, and here's the, and it's, it's, not, it's not a conflict with our environment, it's a conflict in our hermeneutic or in ways of interpretation. There is one hermeneutic that says, unless the Bible speaks to it, you don't practice it. And that's in conflict with the hermeneutic that says, unless the Bible doesn't speak against it, and it's in harmony with common sense, then you can do it. You see the difference? Because the Bible doesn't speak to every area. So if the Bible speaks to it, that's truth. But do you need to say then, if the Bible doesn't speak to it, then, then you can't do it. Or if the Bible doesn't speak to it, and it's in harmony with common sense, then can you practice it? And that is a dynamic that is part of the discussion uh, uh, that happened when we organized as a church in 1860, and James White brought up and, and persuaded us to organize because we were against organization at the time because we believed that organization was part of Babylon, and he brought up the argument. Uh, unless the Bible speaks, doesn't speak against it, we should do it so we can hold property, so we can have licenses for our pastors, so that we can have some stability. And that won today. In the argument today, it didn't go forward. And that's dealing with the role of women in the church. But just realize that it's in dialogue together and the role of the Bible is to make us wise unto salvation. If it speaks against us, against something, then we don't practice it. If it doesn't speak against something, then we have to use common sense and what's going to give glory to God. All right, so I, this is an awesome, uh, relevant topic, the church and education today. And I think you, you've brought up a point, uh, Larry, and it's created the difficulties to us. I think some have blown it out of proportion. If I go to a university that is a secular university to get my PhD in science, then I'm exposing myself to the environmental interpretations of evolution. And so we have had some of our professors that have actually been influenced that way and have had to be challenged. I think some people say that's permeated more than is reality, uh, but there is a danger there. Wherever you go, remember, you are being influenced by that environment. All right, um, now here's the important question then. Because, <clears throat> because through the century, religious leaders have feared heretics and have felt they have to keep the church pure, they have tended to be a very, very cautious and careful about dialogue on anything that was or appeared to be contradictory of the day. Let me uh, bring it up. Um, leadership, true or false, leadership through the century has struggled to allow open dialogue on different questions in life and has a tendency to declare the answers to believe and practice. And they've done that to protect the church but uh, it has made a difficulty. For example, do you think that we would benefit as a church? And I realize it takes a certain level of our own willingness to, to be uncomfortable and to get into an area that have different points of view. But unless you get into that dialogue and, and bring Christian and Bible principles to it, uh, uh, unless you do that, it is difficult for you to seek and to find what is truth. If you say, we can't talk about it, uh, and sometimes parents do that to children when children bring up difficult questions. Can't talk about that, this is the declaration. And the children say, wow, 
Okay, we're not going to talk about that. But then they don't know. I've listed just a couple uh, things. Is it appropriate for us to dialogue on some of the difficult questions? I believe it is. Because how are our young people, and how are we going to know what to decide and what is truth unless we wrestle with tough issues? For example, are there times when suicide would be okay for God, by God? Are there times that suicide would be okay in God's sight? I'm not saying it is or isn't. I'm saying, would it be good for us to talk about it, bring the principles of the Bible, wrestle with it, and bring those dynamics of the Bible out so we can come to, okay, yes it is, yes it's not. Um, so I'm not saying it is, but I'm saying, is it a question we should die? Yeah, we should, especially in the light of euthanasia. Wouldn't it be good for us? Wouldn't you like to sit here and have a panel up there of informed people and dialogue about it and learn from it? Another question. Does a Christian person have the right to not provide services to the same-sex couple? Do they have that right? Yes or no? On what basis? Would you do it? Why would you or why wouldn't you do? We should be talking about these subjects. How do you respond to some youth who are choosing to live together without a marriage commitment? Should we be talking about it? Our young people are doing it and we're saying little because we're not talking about it. We haven't dialogued, we haven't taught them. And so the environment has its, its say and its way and in our education. Is the home the only place that should be talking about it? And perhaps the home thinks, well, the church should talk about that. I shouldn't. Should we search for the truths of the Bible to speak to questions that are not clear? Do we need to be afraid of exploring truth? Can truth stand inquiry? Truth can stand inquiry. And do you think that there are some tough questions that may not have a clear answer and we won't be able to find the answer and we say, no, I, we just can't come to a conclusion on that question. And are there some questions we need to allow to the individual for them to decide? Or do we as a church, should we have a proclamation on every question that's possible? I believe that we would benefit by dialoguing and talking about and helping each other with the principles to resolve those questions. You may or may not agree with me, but I believe we benefit by our, that was one of the benefits of the old, uh, what used to call them Friday night meetings, um, Saturday night meetings where you'd have, AYs was it called, Adventist Youth, where you'd have dialogues, you'd have questions, and you'd have panel discussions. The, the, the benefit that comes in our talking and perspectives is that the Bible becomes alive. The Bible can be investigated. The principles there can help us today. Okay, let's go to Monday's lesson. Monday's lesson's call to live as light. To live as light. True or false? The light you live has more to do with who you are than what you believe. The light that you live has more to do with who you are than what you believe. Does that have truth in it or is that false? You think that's true? Why is that true? So you believe that who you are portrays more light to others than what you believe? She would agree. Anyone that feels differently, that what you believe has more influence on others than who you are. What does it say about the devil? Even the devil believes. So he believes the truth. What's his influence, positive or negative? negative? So it's not related to his belief, it's related to how he lives. 
Isn't that true? So the knowledge you and I have, it's important because knowledge is the basis of our thinking, but we can override that. Well, even though I, yeah, I can remember my dad say, he said, I'm gonna eat this, but I know I'll suffer. <laughs> and if you ever said, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna eat this, but I know I'll suffer. Yeah, so your knowledge informs you, but your knowledge doesn't motivate you. Knowledge informs you. You have to be motivated by something else. So it says you are the light of the world. You are that. And some people uh, wax eloquent about witnessing. And should you witness or not? You don't have to wax eloquent about that. All of us witness all the time, wherever we are, we're a witness. Whether it's in our home, and our, amongst our relatives, at the workplace, we all are witnesses all the time. People see us, they know us. Um, there are times when you, you move from who you are and how you're living to sharing verbally. And that is the next level. But we, we witness all the time. We're known as, we are the light of the world. We are that. Yeah, go ahead. Ed. Yeah. They sort of like move away. They don't want to ask you too many questions because you're giving them the right answer. You know, like so why do you think that sometimes people move away from you uh, once you become a Christian? Are they afraid or are you a fanatic or an extremist or what? Why do they move away? Are you afraid and are you a fanatic? No, no, a little afraid? Yeah, yeah they think you, you got a few things rattling upstairs. Uh, so that is one of the barriers to overcome. Uh, and what's the opposite of light is darkness. Right. And some people, it says, love to live in the darkness because they don't want their deeds to become fully known. Slowly. Yeah. Okay, the story of the, um, the Good Samaritan. Uh, what did the story Jesus told of the Good Samaritan teach you about how we should live? What did the story of the Good Samaritan teach you about how we should live? When you read that story about the Good Samaritan who helped the guy that was beat up on the road to Jericho, uh, what did that story teach you how you should live? You all agree? Uh, well, do unto others, yeah. Uh, Jesus had a specific comment, and what was his comment about, about that? Who was neighbor. neighbor? Yeah, right? Who was neighbor? And neighbor is the person uh, who was willing to get involved and help a person in need. Next question. Do you think this stories put the Samaritans in a pretty good light? Yeah. It put them in a good light, didn't it? Amongst uh, the people that heard the story. Oh, Jesus is affirming the Samaritans. Now, there's another Samaritan story in John chapter 4, the story of the woman at the well. How did that story put the Samaritans in a good light? What happened in that story that to put the Samaritans in a good light? Story of the woman at the well in John 4. Jesus told the, the woman that about all our houses she had before. Yep. Okay, so the, it, it did put her in a good light because she believed what a Jewish leader was telling, a rabbi was telling her, and that put her in a good light? Was there anything else in that story? Well, she was in a shock too because here was a Jew speaking to a Samaritan. Right. At the well. Right. Thing, right? So that put, that put the Samaritans in a good light. Was there anything else in the story that put the Samaritans in a good light? She hmm? Yes, she went and told everyone, Jadina. What else? How would that follow up? What they? What did they do after that? Yes, uh, they invited him to come and stay for a couple of days, and were hospitable. 
And then they came to the conclusion what? Now we believe why? Because we've heard for ourselves, right? We've heard for ourselves and now we believe. So those, both of those stories put uh, the Samaritans in good light. Now there's one other story that Jesus told that to put the Samaritans good life in good light and involved 10 people that had a certain disease. Anyone remember that story that put the Samaritans in good light? Trudy? Ten lepers. The 10 lepers. And how did that story put the Samaritans in good light? The Samaritan was the only one who came back to say thank you. The Samaritan was the only one when he was healed to come back and say thank you. Yes. So in talking about letting your light shine, uh, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good, what? Your good works, your good deeds, and, and then what? And then that glorifies God. Uh, so letting your light shine is who you are, but it needs to be expressed in the way you live, and in the way you live, you glorify. Now, I think we're living in an environment today where unfortunately there have been some deeds done by religious people that haven't been so good. And those deeds that have been done to, to whether it's indigenous people or homes that children have been to, and the way that's been put out, I think there are many people that are turned off. The deeds that have been done can turn people off as well as turn them on. And we're living in an environment today where that's a hill to be climbed in our witness. And so we need greater wisdom. We have to be careful we don't flaunt, but we need greater wisdom in how we let our light shine. Would you agree that the most important possession that we have for Jesus is our influence. Is that a true or false statement? Would you agree that the most important possession you and I have is our influence? Is there anything that you think could top influence when it comes to letting our light shine on other people? Is there anything more important or greater than influence? Why is influence important? Yes, yes. So if, yeah, so the influence you have either, especially if they're sharing Bible truths and they're living like the devil, right? Yeah. Uh, however, I have a friend that uh, I baptized and uh, he stayed in the church for a while then left. But to my surprise, when I visited that area, there were occasionally people coming to church based upon his convincing them of scripture, even though he himself on a 10, but that's unusual, that's unusual. Uh, let me ask you, are there people that could call you on your cell phone right now that you would recognize their voice and they would have your ear immediately? Are there people like that? Sure, you know them, they're friends of yours, if they called right away, you would be able to say, yeah, I'll step outside and talk to you. Are there people that would call that you have no clue, they're, they're strangers to you, and they would call you with important messages today, and you would say, I'm sorry, I'm busy, I can't talk now. So there are people that can call you because they have influence with you, and they have your ear immediately. So influence is important because influence means that you are open to receive what the person has to say. If they have no influence on you, 
then you have a barrier to overcome. Uh, I just think of a quick, quick illustration. Uh, when I was up working in Ontario for eight and a half years, um, I was in more of my prime then and uh, played uh, hockey with a group of guys every week, all year long, and enjoyed it very much. But a lot of these guys were ex-Adventists or marginally Adventists. They were more interested in sports and the world than they were the church. But I can tell you, wherever we met, they were warm and friendly and open because I was part of the team. Do you, do you, you understand what I'm saying? Because I played with them, didn't push religion down the throat. I lived as a Christian and playing. There was no competitional rivalry but there was good healthy competition that in bonding with people, you then can have influence. So if I'm to let my light shine, my light and influence can increase if I bond with people in doing things to support, encourage, and being involved. If you're involved with someone, you can gain. If, you, if you're a stranger, it's less likely you will gain. All right, on Tuesday's lessons were called, were called about living as disciples. Uh, do you remember um, if I live as a disciple for Jesus, are there some things that I should include in my life? If you, were, if you think about I'm living as a disciple for Jesus, uh, I'm a disciple of Jesus, what should you think? think should be included then that I should bring into my life? Can you think of anything that was important to him that should become important to you? Love. Love. Loving people, right? Loving a particular people? Everybody. Loving everyone. Is that right? Is that a struggle for us sometimes? Yeah. Um, I remember one time I blew it real bad and I really kicked myself after. I was following a guy uh, driving and he was behind a car and that car quickly pulled over and he was too close. And so he quickly tried to miss the car went across the line, but there was a car coming the other way. And so he, coming the other way, tried to avoid it, but in doing that, he went into the ditch, all the suitcases come out, and this guy felt terrible. So I pulled over, everyone pulled over. Most of the people, how did they relate to that older guy who did that? But he, he didn't do it intentionally, right? He didn't expect that car to pull over. It was an accident. It was an accident. And I fell in the same trap of having a negative feeling towards that person. And I kicked myself. He needed someone to show a little compassion, a little care. He didn't do it deliberately. Nobody had killed. Yeah, it was an accident. Um, someone had their vacation messed up. But it's so easy to get caught that you love people not because they're good all the time. You love people because you love people. And some of them are smelly, right? Some, are, some of them you wouldn't want to have as your closest friend for life, but you love people because Jesus sees them not only as they are, but what they can become with him. And Jesus loves people. And we have to work on that because our natural tendency is to love people that are like us, that live exactly like us. But we're called to love people because God loves people. And that's what Jonah was told. He says, these people should die. The fire should come down. God says, shouldn't I love the people of Nineveh, 125,000 people that know, don't know their left hand from the right hand? They are mine. I created them. I love them. Right? Okay, love of people is one of the principles to guide us. Uh, include fellowship uh, with with fellow members from Sabbath to Sabbath. Do you think that's one of the principles of Jesus? He wants to encourage fellowship and it was his custom on Sabbath to come. Uh, live to benefit people. See my resources as a trust from God to help people 
and further his kingdom. Live to serve rather than be served. That was his model. Be willing to have a discomfort of being exalted, singled out, and persecuted. Be willing to be discomforted. Most of us like to be liked all the time, but there are times that you have to be willing to be discomforted. Be willing to go out of my comfort zone. Be encouraged by the promise that Jesus shared. Now, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus indicated from reading Isaiah what his work was. And if we were to be disciples of Jesus, then it would be an encouragement for us to try to parallel what Jesus said his work was. Can anyone remember from from Luke chapter 4, when he was reading Isaiah, some of the things that he said he was called to do? He was anointed to what? Preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those that are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Very much involved with people, very much taking people where they were and liberating them, liberating them, to give them a fuller, wholesome, complete life with hope. So Jason talks about Jesus was involved with people. He did more time being involved with people than actually seeing his mission only as preaching. Yeah. Uh, I, and I think our generation doesn't like preaching preach. <laughs> We're not open <laughs> to that. Now, maybe you haven't caught, but um, when Paul was before King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, verse 17 and 18, He listed what God had sent him to do. So here was a follower of Jesus. And this is what he said he was sent to do in Acts 26. See if you can pick it up. I'll read it. God said to to him, I will deliver you from the Jewish people. These were people that were out persecuting. As well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance amongst those who are sanctified by faith in me. So he mentions two main things there that he was sent to do. Did you pick up one of them? He was to do what? To the Gentiles and Jews that he sent to. Yes. Uh, But in order to turn them from darkness to light, he had to help do what? Open their eyes. Open their eyes. Do we realize that if our eyes are open with truth, that not everybody's eyes see it just like we see it? Right? Yeah. And we need to, even though, you know, the the person is educated, refined, cultured, dresses well, good appearance, that means their, their eyes could still be dark, right? Could still be in blindness. So one of the works of Paul, his obligation, and does it parallel to ours, we are sent to help open the people's eyes so they can see. They can see. They are to receive You see Yes. Yes. Yeah. Unless your eyes is open, unless your eyes are open, you cannot receive. Unless your eyes are open. And so, so I, am, I am sent, he said, to help open the eyes of the people so they can see. Um, and there are several blind, blind things that can close your eyes so you don't see. Uh, and have you ever had an experience with, wow, now I see. I didn't see that before. Anyone have a testimony of something like that? Now I see it. I didn't see that before. But now I understand. 
Anyone have an experience like that they can think about? Yes, yes. And it's great. I mean, I, I feel wonderful. But trying to communicate to someone else who believes otherwise, that's when you're, you have pain in your heart because you can't get through it. Yeah, when your eyes are open, you can see. You generally want to share that with others, and that can be painful to them and to you. Uh, yeah. Don't tell me because if I know, then I'll have a struggle. I won't be able to do it anymore, right? <laughs> So some people don't want to see. If I don't understand, if I don't see, then I don't feel guilty if I don't know. So God, one of God's messages to us is, hey, help, help encourage people so they can see choices that, that are being made here are either going to lead them to be more captive uh, or be set free in harmony with principles of Jesus. Yeah, Ed? Yes. When you go to a, to a Catholic church or whatever, you see something different. You see great brown pieces, yes. white bread, and you see water, and you see wine. Yes. Strange for a priest to do that, to drink wine when they're representing God or representing Jesus. Yes. To me, you feel like you have to say, don't you know what you're doing? Yes. You know? Uh, yeah, when you visit uh, other Christian churches and their practices, yeah. uh, you may say, I don't feel comfortable uh, with that. Uh, but this is where dialogue with other people is important to respect what they f understand and they will respect what you understand, but it's in dialogue and having different perspectives that you're able to evaluate by your study of the Bible. If you don't dialogue with others, then you don't have your own thinking challenged. Um, and it's in having your minds challenged that you investigate and then you have to come to a conclusion. So how important for us to see that we as a church have a responsibility in educating uh, to see that in our services, in our times together, we address some of the difficult challenges. We have shied away from d dialoguing on some of the difficult challenges, and I encourage for us to consider them. There are some big questions that are being raised today, and it would not hurt for us to have dialogue about them and to bring the Christian principles, because when I hear your perspective, you hear mine, we, we can bring that and say, okay, that'll help me. Even though I can't come to a full conclusion, I do accept the principles I bring to the discussion. And it's, it's accepting the, the principles you bring in discussion that God will give you the insight what you should do when you're in that difficult place. So our time is up and I'll close with a the poem that we sing, open my eyes that I might see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands a wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, spirit divine. Open my ears that I might hear voices of truth thou sendest clear. And while the wave notes fall on my ear, everything false will disappear. Open my mouth that I, and let me bear tidings of mercy everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare love for thy children thus to share. Open my mind that I might read more of thy love in word and deed. What shall I fear while yet thou dost lead? Only for light from thee I plead. Loving Father, we your children, stand today in a very complex uh, environment. Um, we come embracing the Bible that has relevance to today and yet is resisted in so many places. But may it never be resisted in our lives. May we search to know your will and how we should live. May your people be a people that continue to grow, that we are known as a people who love to learn, especially learn of your word, but not be afraid to learn from our environment in the wholesome things. Thank you for hearing in Jesus' name.
Amen. We have uh, going in the community to know their needs, to uh, work with them, to work with their ideas. We ask them, what is your opinion? What is your thoughts? So we are working according to their acceptation. It's my passion and zeal to work for Christ. I have seen and learned the sacrifice of Christ who died for us and he gave us that much grace and this that's why I decided to be a pioneer to be a his worker and this is the place where uh, work was not completed the Adventist message uh, was not started so I decided to come to this area because that time there is no one is there uh, who can teach about the three angel masses. When I see the need of this city, I decided to start working. Just to mingle with them, make friendship with them. They, we have invited them for uh, dinner and all. So likewise, we have make circle, friend. When people, they seeing all these communities work, they, they, they want to appreciate us. They want to join with us. They want to shake hands with us. We have decided to work for these people. And now we have gathering with the people. So the center of influence we have tried from long time. Lord give us a place. So finally we receive this uh, residence. People are coming from villages to this place to get the knowledge, to religious knowledge for the basic information. So this place is actually is a, a center of influence for many people who are staying uh, nearby this city. So when we work it, we work only for the lots, not for the money, not for other things. So people, they have seen the genuine and love, the genuity and the faithfulness of Christ. So that's why they like it. When they like it, then they like the teaching also. We are teaching and touching the lives of many people. I have seen that it's not me or my work or my own strength. It's the Holy Spirit, it's the God who are working in behind and front of us. So I feel much excited and happy. And I want to thank God. He is still leading me.